Thank you very much. Everyone, good morning. Welcome to this meeting of the Employment and Staffing Committee at South Camps District Council. Uh, my name is Councillor Henry Batchelor and I'm the chair of this committee. Uh, members who are present in the chamber, please note that everything on your desk, including your laptop, papers, etc., can be seen. So please just be aware of that as the meeting goes on. Uh, the camera follows the microphone after it's been switched on, so councillors and officers are advised to wait a few seconds before speaking to allow the camera to catch up with the microphone. Uh, those who are participating in the live stream, please indicate if you wish to speak via the chat column. Please do not use the chat column for any other purpose other than registering yourself to speak. Please make sure your device is fully charged and that you switch your microphone off unless you're invited to do so otherwise. Please ensure you've switched off or silenced any other devices you have so that they do not interrupt proceedings. Uh, and when you're invited to address the meeting, please make sure your microphone is switched on. After you've finished addressing the meeting, please turn your microphone off, speak, speak slowly and clearly, and please do not talk over or interrupt anyone else. Uh, members, please note if we need to have a vote for any particular reason, we'll do so via the microphones in front of us. Only those members who are present in the chamber will be allowed to vote. Um, I can confirm that we are quorum, so we'll proceed. Uh, but before we start with apologies, I just wanted to take a couple of minutes um, just to make a quick announcement for those that aren't aware. Our, the, the previous head of HR, Susan Gardner-Craig, has left the council. Um, I just want to thank her for her service at the council. She's been a long-serving member of South CAMS, I think over 15 years she's been with us. Um, and she's supported this committee uh, very well over the years. Um, she was the real driver behind the Disability Confident Initiative that we are now part of, um, and also the various surveys that the uh, staff surveys that the council has run over the years. So I just wanted to register, um, register my thanks as chair of the committee to, for her support for the committee over the years, and she will be very much missed. Uh, Councillor Williams, John Williams, do you want to say something? Uh, uh, thank you, Chair. I'd just like to add my, um, you know, as you to, to thank uh, Susan as the um, um, lead member for um, finance and staffing. She's been enormously helpful to me. Um, we, um, I, you know, we, we successfully negotiated last year's pay increase, um, and um, she's given me an enormous amount of advice on staffing matters. So, uh, you know, I, I echo what you say. Okay. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Howell. Yes, thank you, Chairman. Uh, again, I would also like to be um, connected and echo what you've already just said. Um, I've worked with Susan for many, many years and was portfolio holder for um, staffing and, um, I can't remember what it was, <laughs> staffing anyway, <laughs> staffing at one point and worked with Susan very closely during that time period and all the time she's been given very fair, very good advice and I wish her the very best of success wherever Susan has gone. And, yeah, uh, it'd be uh, very much our loss in their game. I think she was an excellent officer. So, uh, yeah, absolutely. Thank you very She'll much. She'll be sorely missed. Thank you. So with that, members, we'll move on to the business ahead of us today. Uh, we'll start with apologies for absence, please. Patrick Adams. I'm pleased to say, Chair, that we have no apologies and every member is present. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, item two, declarations of interest. Do any members have any interest to declare for any items on the agenda today? No. Nope. So we'll move on to three minutes of previous meeting. Members, we have the minutes from the meeting held in July on pages one to four of our agenda. Does anyone have any comments or alterations they wish to make? No, okay. Then I'll sign those as a correct record at the end of the meeting. So we move on to the substantive business. We're looking at the retention and turnover report for quarter one of this year, which starts on page five of our agenda. And I believe we have Jonathan Corbett. I believe you'll be presenting this to us. That's correct. I'd just like to share my screen. I've got a presentation that I will put on the screen for everybody. Go ahead. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, this retention and turnover report provides an, anal an analysis of the turnover of staff for quarter one of 2021 to 2022. So that's the 1st of April to the 30th of June. Um, the goal of the report is to highlight trends, inform recruitment decisions, and support development of an effective resource strategy to achieve our goals. 
Um, in terms of the turnover, uh, the main turnover statistics that were highlighted in this particular quarter, uh, the rate of voluntary leavers has increased to 3.95% in quarter one. This is above the target level of 3.25%, and this is the first time it's reached this level in the last two years. Um, at the moment, the rolling average hasn't increased significantly because it's, there's been a, a very significant increase from in, in just one quarter. But it will, by, by analysing the rolling average, be able to indicate if the higher turnover remains a long-term trend. Um, the areas with the most significant turnover in this time period were shared waste, HR and corporate services, and housing. Um, uh, one, one point to note um, about the stability index is following the introduction of our new HR system, iTrent, we are unable to report on our stability index until we have a full year of post history because we don't have 12 months of post history within our system. However, we can resume reporting on this in quarter one of next year. Um, given the high level of recent turnover, our stability index is likely to be in excess of the target of 80%, which suggests you know, a potential need to review current um, retention initiatives. Um, in the last quarter, quarter one, we had a 44% exit interview return rate, which is in line with the average over the last two years. And I believe that we discussed, that it was mentioned at the last uh, meeting, the option to state no reason specified has been removed and so shouldn't appear in the next quarter two report. Uh, in terms of involuntary levers, um, the most important point or the most notable point really is that there were three redundancies in quarter one. Um, these were the three members of the catering team within the facilities as a result of the closure of the canteen at Camborne. Uh, and the exit interview data shows uh, that several people cited similar reasons for leaving in this quarter, including a desire for more career progression, a higher salary, change of role and more job security. Um, the most valued features of working for South Cams were working hours, flexi time and working environment. Um, in the, the areas that scored uh, the least favourably were salary and professional development, although um, that is a, um, you know, that it is in comparison to the other factors. Uh, the vast, however, the vast majority of people would consider working for us again, and relatively few uh, respondents rated any of the factors as poor. Um, when you look at the UK labour market trends and the CRPD report for uh, May 2021, so a roughly the same period of time, it shows there is a continuing rise in uh, positive net employment intentions. So there's a, a, in, has been an increase from uh, uh, a rating of a plus 11 points to plus 27 from February to May. And there's been a very dec a sharp decline in redundancy intentions and a rise in recruitment intentions. There's a much more positive uh, job outlook uh, than six months ago, and the recruitment intentions in the public sector remain high at 81 uh, percent. It, it reflects a general trend of rising recruitment intentions and higher turnover uh, across the UK labour market as a whole. There's been a and the CIPD attribute, attributes this to the general improvement in economic outlook as businesses have reopened following the COVID-19 lockdown. In terms of uh, recruitment, uh, during this period of time, recruitment of vacancies remains high at 84% success rate. Uh, we had one new apprentice starting during quarter one, although new opportunities have been advertised and successful recruits will be starting shortly. At the moment, there are 32 agency staff across all departments, with 22 in um, Greater Cambridge Shared Planning uh, alone. This is a significant increase over the last six months, um, and almost all of this is related to the increase within the planning service. Uh, the Casual Worker Bank recruited four new casual starters in quarter one, and that's helped to reduce our reliance on agency workers somewhat. Um, Appendix E of the report has been amended. It now contains ethnicity statistics for South Cam's district uh, in 2011, um, following the feedback received at the previous um, Employment and Staffing Committee. Uh, this shows that black and minority ethnic employees are slightly underrepresented as a proportion of the known total of the local population, although the fact that 10% of employees haven't disclosed their ethnicity means that or hadn't disclosed at that time means um, all the proportions are off, uh, you know, it, it's not fully reflected in, in, in uh, you know, it's hard to gain exactly what the exact proportions are. However, when the new census data from this year has been fully published, We'll be able to update the comparators so we'll have a much more up to date um, uh, reflection of what the true statistics are. Uh, finally, we've got the uh, the new HR system has enabled more thorough reporting. 
on the council's employee profile. We've been able to report on a number of protected characteristics from quarter one of this year, which we hadn't been able to do before. Um, the most significant variations that we found in quarter one were related to age. Um, the 29% of leavers in quarter one were under the age of 30, although they only count for 13% of the workforce. Um, and of the seven voluntary leavers uh, amongst this group, all of them stated they had a new job offer, were relocating, or the position was not what they had expected. Um, there was a slight overrepresentation in terms of male leavers in quarter one, but this was largely the result of an increased turnover of shared waste, refuse loaders, and drivers. Um, this was mainly due to personal reasons such as relocation, new job offers, and to maintain a better work life balance. Um, there were no significant variations in leavers based on ethnicity, disability, and religion compared to the proportions within the council at the moment. Does anybody have any questions? Um, I will open up to members if there's any questions or comments they wish to um, put to you. Uh, we'll start with Councillor Daunton. Please. Yes, uh, thank you. And thank you for a, a very good presentation and a very thorough report. Um, I'm looking at page uh, 15, paragraph 29, uh, which talks about um, the common reasons for voluntary turnover, more career progression. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm just wondering how we can handle that. Because clearly, if you want to stay within the organization, um, some areas need a professional qualification. So if you wanted, say, to move from housing uh, to environmental health, um, in order to progress in environmental health, you'd need a professional qualification. So what can we do um, to help those people who want to move within the organization? Um, do we offer um, help with professional qualification? Um, and, and how is, it, how is co career progression discussed? Jonathan? Yes, absolutely. Um, we have, um, one of the things that we have, obviously, is our annual uh, 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 PDR cycle, um, where employees can discuss with their manager about um, you know, different options they'd like to pursue in terms of their career, future development for the next 12 months. It's something we've been encouraging, and we run um, annual training courses, both for employees and managers to get more out of that particular process. Um, we also have a, an ability for any employee to request particular professional training that they'd like. They can submit an application form and uh, it'd be considered as to be, you know, it would be considered as part of the training budget. So if someone was moving into a new area they wanted to develop in, there is um, the, the option for uh, somebody to be supported to learn the necessary professional qualifications to perform that role. Good to come back. Yeah, yes, uh, and just another supplementary question. So we've heard in the past about um, staff moving from the call centre, getting uh, the experience of answering queries and then moving into one of the divisions departments um, in the council. Is that still happening successfully? It would, it would be something I perhaps would, would need to look into a little bit further and determine what, you know, about contact centre levers over, over a period of time. I wouldn't be able to confirm that in the detail, but I can certainly um, speak to the contact centre managers and determine if, if that's happening and, and what, you know, what's been happening in, in specific detail. But it's a good point that contact centre employees, that's generally one of our, you know, I would say an entry level position. And it would be, it's a very good place in which we'll to learn those uh, essential customer service skills and uh, go forward. So I will, I will follow that up for the contact centre. Thank, Thank you, Jonathan. Uh, Councillor Heather Williams. Thank you, Chair. Um, I've got a couple of questions. They mainly relate to page 14 and 15, which I think is the same in the paper as well as the online. Sometimes they're different. So you might want to, there's also paragraph. 25, 26, and 28 that I'm looking at. Um, when With paragraph 25, um, it, I think it would be helpful, although I'm normally cautious of percentages, but I think it would be helpful to know how the percentage of the, of the department that has the agency staff, because it, if it's one in 50, then um, we're going to be less worried if it's one out of two. Um, for example, so I think that would help to have that information um, supplied with that for future reference, please. Um, on paragraph 26, the Casual Worker Bank, I think that's great to see that that's working. It's a really good initiative um, 
and um, you know, hopefully it would be good to see some more positive results out of that because I think that could potentially be um, a real winner for the council. In relation to page uh, paragraph 28, um, we're looking at the turnout rates. I do wonder if it's if it's right to be sort of comparing it to the last two years because they're very COVID driven years and we know from a lot of the data and the information that because of a feeling of job security and those sorts of things, people were naturally more reluctant to leave their, their professions or their jobs in all sectors if they had some form of job security. Um, so, because I know it's saying it's risen significantly, but I'm, I'm sort of wondering if it's possible to look at sort of a pre-COVID um, comparison to give us some reflection as to whether where it's actually going, because I think... Um, it's probably not quite fair to compare it to the to the COVID COVID period, um, where you know I know a lot of people were just pleased they had a job. They weren't looking for elsewhere in those circumstances, um, and there weren't the opportunities. Um, we weren't competing as a council. We weren't competing as much. I think I remember Councillor Howell saying, "If lots of people were applying here, that was not good news for our economy," uh, because. because uh, uh, I don't know if that's Fair quite enough. how, I think it was a valid point, actually, that um, if council intake starts going up, that's normally not a positive figure for the, for the rest of the world. Um, so with that in mind and that sentiment, could we have some pre-COVID figures to compare it to, please? Thank yeah. you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, Jonathan, I'm not sure how easy those figures are to come by, but um, yeah, I think you've heard the, the request there. I'm not sure if that would be possible for the next set of uh, data we'll be looking at. Yes, I can take the, um, the historic turnover levels because one of the things we've done is maintain for the last two years we've been uh, living this for the last eight quarters. I can certainly do that. I can say as a summary that the the turnover for the last two years has been significantly lower. It's been at the level or lower than the 3.25%. So this is the first time it's, it's reached this level, but happy to provide that information. Yeah, I think that'll be um, useful. I believe that actually there may be in, in one of the graphs of the report, I, in one of the appendices, there is a record of the um, of the rate of turnover as, as it's uh, changed over the over the last couple of years. But uh, if not, I can certainly provide it. Okay. Yeah, Councillor Williams from Clarkson. Thank you. My mine was sort of a percentage of the department. So is there a diagram okay. that shows rather than a trend? It's it's. Is it 22 out of 200 or 22 out of 25? Because I think our level of concern would be very varied depending on what, what those figures are out of. Thank you. Yeah, that, that's, that's fair. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Jonathan. Um, Councillor Howell, please. Before I say my question, I think we should <coughs> clarify what uh, Councillor Williams, uh, Heather Williams, stated. What it is, I always believe that um, if there's a public sector, uh, job equivalent that we have here in South Cairns, such as planning and law, and suddenly we have a lot of applications from lawyers and um, planning officers, that means that things in the private sector are quiet <laughs> and they, they start to come over here. That's what I was trying to say. But yes, I do stick to uh, that. Yeah. Absolutely yeah. understood. Yeah. Um, <laughs> just a quick question, really, uh, and it follows along what's already been said. So on page 11, paragraph 15, it says there, uh, in contrast, salary and professional development are viewed least favorably. Now, not so much career development, but professional development within their own career, whether it be paying their fees for um, any professional organizations people are a member of, or increasing their ability and knowledge range within that area. Is that something that we've got to look at in the future? Because that's something we can address quite quickly, as opposed to salary and other factors that are involved there. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. Uh, Jonathan, does anyone want to comment on that? Yes, um, certainly we are. Even in a method of every year, we we take we ask people as part of their PDRs to complete any particular training or anything that's going on at the moment. I know because I've been overseeing the um, the training budget for the last two years that we've run over two hundred courses or two hundred learning events, and we've also been keen to um, run you know ask. Um, employees and managers what sorts of things that they would like to improve their professional development so we're always taking that type of feedback we've also run a number of um, HR courses specifically and we're looking to develop uh, some more ones in future to help managers that are new to their role and perhaps haven't had those the same type of uh, shadowing uh, opportunities that they might have had had everyone been in the office 
Yes, thank you, Chairman. Uh, thank you for that. That really is appreciated and that information is good. Um, the one thing I want to ask, and just going off slightly on a tangent, if we put somebody on a substantial course, we always used to sign them up to, if they left within a certain time period, they had to pay back the, the difference in the money. I can see nodding of heads going on up there already. Uh, can, is that we still doing that? And that is, do we actually do it, I suppose, is the question I'm asking. Yes, I believe we do, yes. It would uh, be something that would be agreed as part of the, if someone has applied to, you know, a, attend a more substantial course, we would. Okay. Thank you. Councillor John Williams, please. Uh, thank you, Chair. We'll just um, pick up on some of the points being raised so far. I mean, um, certainly on progression within the organisation, that's an area clearly that uh, has come up. And... Um, you know, as the cabinet member for staffing, I will be looking, taking that forward, um, and we'll see whether or not um, we need to have a special uh, review of that. Um, on the point of um, um, Councillor Howe made, and and about um, you know retention of staff at the moment. Um, don't think we'll see a truer picture until probably quarter three because don't forget we have recently increased pay um, which won't actually start to um, work through until the third quarter so it'd be interesting to see given the other councils that um, are in the joint negotiated um, in J and C have yet to settle be very interesting to see what effect our 2.5% pay increase has had um, on retention. Mm. So I think um, I don't think until quarter three will we start seeing a, a, a true picture of the effect of COVID uh, and other economic um, you know effects. And then the third point I'm just going to pick up. I mean, I went in initially into public service not for the money but for the pension. And it's unfortunate that nowadays, you know, that's not true. You know, um, you, you don't get a final salary pension anymore, um, even in public service. And I suspect that any, um, you know, that the, 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 the benefit of having that is, is no longer there. And therefore, you know, we have to compete on, on salary or, or wages. And I think local government it's going to have to wake up to the fact that we are in a competitive labour market and we don't want to go back to the situation of the 1970s and 80s where local government was short of staff because it could not compete with the private sector. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you. I don't think any questions there, but uh, some comments, I think, to note. Um, Councillor Percival. Thank you. Um, it's evident that staff are leaving the organisation partly because of lack of professional development opportunities as well as um, limited career progression. I wondered what, if anything, is being done around utilising the apprenticeship levy for development opportunities for our existing staff? Yes. Um, we are doing a, a great deal in terms of developing apprenticeship levies. I believe we've already run a full cohort of the management apprenticeship scheme for new and aspiring managers to complete. And, uh, and that's something that we, you know, we can then reclaim the money at a later date. Um, we're also running a new cohort and looking at um, developing very specific new apprenticeships um, for, you know, different areas and, and, and different um, disciplines. So it's, it's something that we are looking to expand because of how successful our first uh, cohort has been. Thank you very much. Uh, members, I don't think there's any further questions, so uh, we've just been asked to note and comment on the report, which I think, believe we have done. So, well, Jonathan, thank you very much for your time today and your input. That's been very useful. Thank you very much. Thank you. So, members, we'll move on to item five on the agenda, which is the quarter one report for sickness absence, and that begins on page 35. Um, Lindsay, welcome. I believe you'll be presenting this to us today. 
Yes, I'm presenting this today on behalf of Chloe Whitehead. Um, Chloe um, was the report author, but she's been unable to attend today due to a clash with another meeting. Um, so yeah, I'm going to present the report on Chloe's behalf today. Um, so just to um, confirm, the, this report that, that covers the period from the 1st of April through to the 30th of June um, this year. Um, and it's the quarterly performance monitoring report. As it says um, in the report, um, now that we've successfully implemented our new HR payroll system, um, it's given us the option to um, break down um, the stress um, absences into three different areas. So it's um, stress, anxiety and depression, whether it's personal or work, or it could be work and personal. So that helps us better identify um, the causes of the stress-related absence. It does mean, however, that the reports are showing a decrease of 178 days attributed to stress and depression and mental health um, because that category is not being used anymore. However, there is only an actual decrease of 65.5 days. Then moving on to our um, performance indicator figure, um, for this quarter, that is 2.03 days per FTE, and that's based on 584.7 FTE. That is an increase of 48.77% compared to quarter four, um, but it's also an increase of 37.44% compared to quarter one last year. Um, that's shown on the graph in the report. Um, just to say, um, our absence figures have been steadily increasing since January this year, and they're now at the highest they have been in the last 12-month period. The reason for this, we feel, is probably as a result of lockdown gradually easing, and people are um, obviously going out more, and they're mixing more, and then they're more um, being subject to various bugs and viruses and things. Um, and then just in terms of, of the number of days, so in quarter one, the absence, um, the days lost for absence, sorry, it was 1,186.5 days, which is an increase of 491 days. Um, at the moment, we're not able to um, show the, the breakdown between long-term and short-term absences. Um, but as our new HR system's been implemented, we are developing the reports um, and we're hopeful that we will be able to report on this um, in the future. Um, and then in terms of numbers of employees who have had absence in the period, there was 132 employees had absences. Um, however, that meant that 524 did not have any absences during the period. Then thinking about what support is in place for um, absences related to stress, depression and mental health. During quarter one, the HR team um, have delivered various managerial masterclasses. Um, one of this is entitled Managing Stress and another one is around managing sickness. We continue to deliver these uh, training sessions on a quarterly basis for all managers. Um, feedback from those that have attended has been very positive. Um, so as I say, we're continuing to um, deliver these. Uh, when we are notified of a member of staff who is off with stress, depression, mental health, um, a member of the HR team works with the manager and the employee to put the relevant support in place. And that can be either using one of the wellness action plans that we use a stress identification tool, um, we consider whether a referral to our occupational health provider is necessary. And then the council also has two different types of counselling we can refer staff to. One is through our employee assistance provider, that's telephone based counselling. Um, or if other employees would prefer to see somebody um, it's video and um, face to face at the moment rather than in person face to face. We have our um, evolved counselling service that we can refer staff to. And then we also arrange welfare visits um, 
Again, that may be virtually or it could be in person, depending on the circumstances for all um, employees who are off with long term absence. And then in terms of support for musculoskeletal absences, um, all staff, whether working at home or in the office, um, complete a DSE assessment. And then also there is separate manual handling um, assessments for our manual workforce based at the depot. And again, if, if a member of staff is off with, with the nat that nature of illness, we would refer them to our occupational health provider for advice and guidance on what they are able to do and what support we need to put in place. Um, just moving on through the report, um, there's a table which shows the summary of isolation and days lost to COVID. In terms of, um, in terms of working days lost to COVID, all employees who reported isolation were based at the depot. Um, it's likely that there could have been other staff that were isolating, but because we're working from home at the moment, and if they're well enough, they were still able to work. But obviously our depot based staff, because of the nature of their job, if they need to isolate, they, they're not able to work. And um, so that I would say that's how that that figures there. Um, and then again, in terms of um, support that we're providing, I've, I've, I've um, highlighted some of the things that we've been doing um, and we're continuing to you know, think of other things that we can do, how we can best support our managers and our employees while we're continuing to work from home. Um, and yeah, that's kind of the highlights that I just wanted to cover from the report. So I don't know if anybody has any specific questions they'd like to ask. Yeah, thank you for that, Lindsay. If you wouldn't mind holding on, I'm sure there will be some questions for you. And we do have one straight off the bat from Councillor Gorton. Thank you. Um, yes, thank you for, for the report and, and for the presentation. Um, I want to tie together the previous report and this one, um, because in the previous report it was mentioned that one of the benefits that staff feel is a flexible working. Um, and if we extend that to home working, the increase in home working, has there been any tracking of um, whether or not home working is actually lowering stress or increasing stress? Um, and a, a sort of um, a bit of research, really, on the effect of home working. Um, I'm not aware if any tracking has been done, but that's a good point, and that's certainly something that we could look at moving forward. I think that would be really important because yeah. um, it, it's going to be very different in different circumstances, and it might really be very useful to do a survey based on that. Yeah. 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 Thank Great. you. Thank you, Lindsay. Uh, Councillor Heather Williams, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, just one thing I want to clarify on page 54. Um, it looks like there should be another graph at the bottom. I can see that, and I'm not sure if that's something we should have or shouldn't. Um, so I just wondered if you could clarify. I don't know if you can see on the paper, there's kind of like... Okay. I think it's a continuation from the page below. I so, appreciate you're looking on your iPad. Yeah, because I'm, I'm doing <laughs> the paper the... briefing, so I'm like, is, is that a, um, yeah. So we can just clarify what that random blue bit is I've got on the bottom of my screen, please. I, I, think, um, I think it's likely a repo graphics error. <laughs> <laughs> oh, right, okay, yeah, it makes yeah. sense if you've got the paper version. Right, yeah, thank you for that. Um, and the other thing was, um, in looking at the impact, obviously, influenza and coughs and colds and things, obviously, we're going to naturally see that going up. Um, just anyway, but there was um, a big flu vaccine rollout at the council last year, and I'm just wondering, will that be happening again? Because I think that obviously could really, really help with those figures going forward. Given I've been in hospital twice with flu, it's not not pleasant, and there's a long recovery as well afterwards. So, Indeed. hoping that's going to happen. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, that actually that is already happening, and um, we had our first flu clinic on Wednesday of this week. And we've got another two planned um, in November. So that's um, we're working with our occupational health provider, and they are based um, in the marketing suite on the business park. Um, and then staff, any member of staff that would like a flu vaccine, um, can come and have that done. Uh, yeah, can John Williams, add, you yeah, come can in. I add that 
um, democratic services have been in touch with us. Uh, someone called me last week to ask the advice. So can you check with them, Heather, because you should have been contacted. Mm. I, I haven't, but then I do have slight email issues still <laughs> ongoing, so it's a bit Indeed. hot. I mean, you might have got my email, John. Sometimes you get my <laughs> email. I haven't been contacted <laughs> yet. Maybe it's just a younger continuum. Uh, I don't know. Me and I are in the younger <laughs> batch, I'm afraid, it John. A, yeah, no, it was a phone call um, I got. But anyway. Um, I haven't had one. It's age-related. I think the oldest, <laughs> right. oldest first. We'll, we'll, we'll leave that one there, then, should we? Yes. Yeah. We'll wait for our call, Henry. Indeed. Um, there has to be some benefit from growing older. <laughs> <laughs> Councillor Hal, please. Thank you, Chairman. Well, I think it would be fair to say that we've never used so much red ink with regards to this report, but then again, we've been through an impressive bit of time and we yes. just can't <laughs> compare these stats to anything else we've ever done. So, you know, we just got to accept them and move on, really. We've got to be fair about this. Um, the only quick question I want to ask is, obviously some staff can work flexible times, and that's great, and I, I'm a big fan of it, but some staff, it's impossible for them to work flexible times. How do we try and help those staff along? And I'm going to give uh, the refuge collectors has been the obvious example I'm thinking of the top of my head, but I'm sure there's many others. What can we do to, to show them that we're trying to help them as well as those who have got flexible time and, um, and work in? Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. Lindsay? Yeah, I mean, obviously, as you say, we, we, we can't do the same kind of flexible working for our refuge staff. Um, however, you know, it, it, there are some members of, of that, that, that workforce, that that working time really suits them. They really like starting early in the day and then, you know, working at six and finishing at two. For example, if they may have children in school or whatever. Um, so that is actually something that they are comfortable with. Um, in terms of what we've got in place at the moment, um, off the top of my head, I can't think of anything specific, but I, I do know that the... Um, the team managers and the, the operation managers at the depot, you know, are in regular kind of contact with the refuse staff that if they did have a need to, you know, leave early one day or something, they will, where they can, they will agree that with them, um, you know, if they had a medical appointment or something like that. Um, so they, they would kind of work that with their, their, their manager. Um, but yeah, it is, you know, it is something that, is difficult because of the nature of the role that they carry out. Yeah, please. That's fine. That's exactly. I mean, I, I can't think of anything off the top of my head, and you know, I mean, I, I have to bow to the officers' um, report here. But uh, yeah, that's difficult. But if, if that can be kept in mind for those members yeah, of staff, absolutely. and unfortunately can't do flexible time, then we can look at something for them as well. That I don't know what, but uh, that'd be great. But uh, thank you, Chair. No, thank you, Councillor. Uh, members, I don't think. Sorry, John Williams, please. Yes, thank you, Chair. Just one quick point. On page uh, 37 of the agenda pack, there's a table which shows total days lost to stress, depression and mental health. And it would appear, and I can understand why this has happened, that all, all days lost up until the first quarter of this year were down to stress, depression and mental health. Obviously, that's not correct. So um, I suspect that we should have had a different colour for those, given that we can't break them down because we can't pair with previous years. But um, it would suggest that up until the first quarter, because it's the same magenta colour, um, that, that everything was stress, depression and mental health until then. Yeah, that, that sorry, um, that's showing that the previously it was grouped as stress, depression and mental health. Whereas now we can break it down into whether that is personal or work or work and personal. So that's why it looks different in quarter one for this year. Essentially, yeah. we've so just started needs, asking needs, what, the, what the cause of the stress is. is. Yeah, I think it needs to make perhaps just a, a note on another paragraph, maybe. Okay, to explain yeah. Explain that. Sure. Yeah. If that can be clarified for the next yeah. report. Okay, yeah, no problem. Thank you very much. Um, members, I think that's all the questions we had. So, Lindsay, again, thank you very much for the report. Thanks for standing in for okay. Chloe. We appreciate uh, your time and your input. Um, thank you. Members, we're on to agenda item six now, which is an update on the Disability Confident Task and Finish Group. Um, 
believe you may have seen the uh, email that Patrick very kindly sent round from Councillor Chung Johnson, who's the, who heads up the task and finish group, uh, giving us a brief update. Um, I'm not proposing to run through it all, but uh, one thing she did ask for was um, whether this committee would like to have a, a discussion around whether the task and finish group needs to continue, given the fact we're now level, uh, achieved level two um, in the disability confidence scheme. Um, so I suppose that's something for us to, to discuss and make a recommendation on today. Councillor Howell. Chairman, as much as I would like to discuss and make a recommendation, I think we need to really look at what is level one and two and what is level three, four and above. Um, my experience in the past has said that level one and two, on, on all things, on all different things we've seen, are normally quite easy and quite yep. administratively. And after that, it gets a little bit more challenging, and that's where the real difficulties and the real impact we can have on the different organisations that are, and different people who use our facilities can make a big impact on, on helping them. So I would ask politely, Chairman, if we could not make a decision today, but rather have a small paper with just what is one and two and what is three and four. Okay, so we so can actually look and see then, yes. Because yeah. okay. if, if, it, if it's just out of proportion for us, then it, it, the answers are no. But if it's sure. small against small increments, then we can say yes. So essentially, we, yeah, a paper comes to the next meeting just describing what needs to be achieved to reach level three, and if that realistic, then we can have a discussion around realistic, whether we think that's Thank possible you, or not. I would, I would prefer that. I'm, I'm, as chair, I'm content with that. Members, do we... Is that a good way forward, do we think? I'm seeing nods, so Councillor Hell, thank you very much. We'll, um, Patrick, if we can have that to the next meeting's agenda, that would be useful. Members, I think we've reached the end of the meeting. Uh, just to note, the date of the next meeting is Friday the 14th of January, so probably one of the first committee meetings of the new year. So, um, yeah, again, I thank everyone for their time, and that's officers, members alike, so thank you very much, and see you all in January. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you.